Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for being with us today to for this special session of the Aid for Trade review, where we will be discussing the very important issue of clean cooking. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you today. I am Jeline Connors Belopolsky, the Chief of Staff and External Affairs at the Clean Cooking Alliance. And I first want to thank the WTO Aid for Trade organizers for allowing us to highlight this important event. I know you have a very busy agenda over the course of the week. We are grateful for you for highlighting this issue. And of course, a very special thank you to the representatives of the United Kingdom and the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Geneva for sponsoring this event. And finally, I would love to thank the representatives of the WTO and other audience members who have kindly joined us at this event today. A few housekeeping before we get going. A, this session will be recorded, so thank you for that. And participants are welcome to add their questions in the webinar chat function. We will have 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A following our panel discussion, and we will try to field as many of those questions as we can. If we don't get to them all in the discussion, we will do our best to answer them in the chat or feel free to reach out and follow up with any questions you may have. I will hand over to my co-moderator for this morning, Mr. Aiko Lim from the World Trade Organization. Thank you, Ho. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here with uh, all of you and also with Jeline, um, my co-moderator. We've been working with CCA for, I think, well, just under a year now, and it's been great to see this progress and ability to come together uh, at Aid for Trade on this very critical issue. Um, I'm the Director for Trade and Environment at the WTO, um, and i like to also thank all the colleagues, uh, both in my division and CCA, for putting this together. You have a fantastic set of speakers, and we'll be starting with, um, with Ambassador Manley, His Excellency Ambassador Manley, who is the currently both Ambassador of the UK uh, to the WTO, as well as the chair of the Committee on Trade and Environment. Um, it would take me too long to read out Ambassador Manley's extensive bio, so I, I won't be doing that completely, just to say that uh, you know we're really privileged to have him here join us at this moment, which is really busy uh, during Aid for Trade. Um, and with that, let me just pass the floor over to Ambassador Manley. Please, Ambassador Manley. Uh, thank you, and um, a source of relief to me, and I'm sure everybody uh, joining us today. Look, thank you both very much for uh, for the introduction, and thank you both uh, for bringing this event uh, together, um, which uh, unites two of my great passions: uh, the environment and cooking. So, uh, what a, what a great event to be here, and it's also it's great that we're doing this on uh, Earth. Overshoot day, by the way, um, which I think is a reminder that you know it's, it's our way of using natural resources is unsustainable, uh, and you know, we currently use manatee uses uh, seventy five percent more than what we think the planet's ecosystem could actually support. Um, and I think you know this year, perhaps more than any, when we face uh, climate uh, driven drought in the Horn of Africa and the Sahel, uh, these issues are so important to us and identifying how we can use trade policy to deliver our objectives in these areas, I think is really important. Um, but look, um, why, why is this important to us? Uh, access to energy isn't just about energy. First obvious thing to say, it's, it's about access to uh, healthcare. To education, to well-being, to productivity, uh, and it's about gender as well. Um, so, according to the WHO, and as ambassador also to the WHO, I believe everything the WHO says. So, I believe on this one. Uh, around two and a half billion people across the globe continue to cook and heat their homes using polluting open fires or simple stoves fueled by kerosene or biomass and coal. Two and a half billion people across the globe. Uh, and that has a health impact, it has a gender dimension to it clearly, and it has an environmental impact. Uh, so health impact. Uh, 
Each year, over 3 million people across the globe die prematurely from illnesses attributable to using, to the sort of household air pollution that is uh, created uh, by using uh, unclean cooking uh, facilities. Uh, that's more than malaria, it's more than tuberculosis. Uh, second, the gender dimension. Uh, as we all know, uh, women and children are disproportionately affected uh, by the health impacts uh, and obviously bear much of the burden of collecting the firewood or whatever which is being used uh, in these uh, unclean cooking stoves. Uh, and then third, and kind of perhaps most obviously, is the environmental uh, impact of all this. Uh, you know, greenhouse gas emissions from non renewable uh, fossil fuels alone total a gigaton of uh, CO2 emissions each year. Um, Residential solid fuel burning accounts for up to 25% of global black carbon emissions, uh, the, uh, which is the, you know, the short-lived climate pollutant. Um, so unless we take action on clean and efficient cooking, we can't achieve our health goals. We can't achieve our goals around the economic empowerment of women and girls and we can't help achieve our net zero goals. So this is a really important issue for us uh, collectively. Uh, that's why it was such an important issue for us back in Glasgow uh, at COP26. Uh, and that's why we brought together stakeholders there um, across the government, business, uh, CSO communities to mobilize new commitments, uh, including the new UN Global Roadmap for accelerated action on sustainable goal seven, uh, which includes the aim to ensure that one billion more people, about two and a half billion people, gain access to clean cooking facilities and solutions by 2025. And that, of course, is only three years away. So one billion people to get clean cooking solutions over the next three years. So that's an ambitious target by any standards. Um, we also announced back in Glasgow um, 125 million pounds to scale up the transforming energy access programs, which includes research development on trying to identify some of these clean cooking solutions. Um, and uh, we also had negotiations, as you may remember, on the joint statement, which committed to end new direct public support for the international unabated fossil fuel energy sector by the end of this very year. Uh, so Glasgow was important on this agenda, uh, but there's a lot more work to do. Uh, just to say a word about what we're trying to do as UK, taking my um, very nice, sustainable WTO trade and environment hat off for a second and replacing it with the union flag behind me. Um, you know, we recognise, as I said before, the, the gender dimension of this, uh, that women and girls in rural, off-grid uh, areas, particularly in LDCs, are disproportionately affected by lack of access to clean cooking facilities. Um, so we have a number of initiatives in this area. Uh, something called the uh, ECOCA, ECOCA partnership, which is developing and testing a business model to scale off-grid clean cooking for refugee populations uh, in Uganda. The Sun Buckets innovation, which is a portable solar powered uh, cook stove that collects, stores and recovers solar energy in portable containers, uh, which we're testing with refugees in Kenya. Uh, Village Help for South Sudan, which is deploying uh, electric pressure cookers, electric induction stoves uh, uh, in all kind of linked to solar and storage mini grids for communities in rural South Sudan. Uh, we've also got a 40 million pound uh, modern energy cooking services program, which is doing research and development to identify some of these new clean cooking technologies to accelerate the uptake uh, of modern energy cooking. Uh, that program has improved clean energy access for almost 5 million people uh, already. Small, but important uh, uh, on that path to the 1 billion that we need to, we need to give uh, clean energy solutions uh, by 2025. So look, access to clean uh, energy has economic benefits, it has health benefits, it has uh, particular benefits for women and girls who shoulder a disproportionate burden 
of a lack of such solutions currently. Uh, but it's uh, an enormous task that we have ahead of us to give uh, solutions, clean energy solutions to that two and a half billion people who are currently uh, without them. Uh, and it's going to need really concerted action. Uh, just three final thoughts. Um, trade can be, should be part of the solution. We need to harness the opportunities of targeted aid for trade, uh, as well as multilateral work, including, of course, uh, in the Committee on Trade and Environment, uh, to enable progress towards these ambitious goals. Um, second, uh, this is one of those issues that if you ever you doubted uh, the linkages between kind of trade, public health, gender, then this is an issue that reveals it all too clearly. This really, the, the multiple dimensions of this issue shows that you need to take a collaborative approach uh, across uh, the multilateral arena, uh, and you need to have a multi-dimensional approach uh, to make it succeed. And I think it's really important that we reflect that in our work here at the WTO. Um, third, and uh, perhaps most sort of fundamental, uh, again, if ever you needed a reminder, this issue shows you why you can't look at climate, environment, development in separate uh, spheres. This is all about thinking across those boundaries, uh, thinking holistically and understanding how, if we get it right, our efforts to deliver net zero also deliver real tangible benefits to some of the most vulnerable people on the planet. And that's why this issue is so important and why as UK and as chair of the, of the Committee on Trade and Environment, I'm so determined to work with you uh, and the others on this call uh, to find timely solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Manley. Um, that was a great set of uh, opening remarks. Um, I think you really put the issue very squarely in terms of the challenge in front of us. Um, and and the, actually the opportunities as well, if I might say, not just a challenge, but the opportunities to actually make a difference. And I think, as you've said, and I've discussed many times with Jalin as well, is that this is one example that I think that trade policy can really concretely make a difference. You know, sometimes we struggle, uh, unfortunately, to try to work out what is this that we should be doing. Yet sometimes the obvious is really right in front of us. I mean, making better access to clean cooking stoves seems to me at least a very clear challenge that trade policy has a, a clear role to play. Um, I was going to pass the floor um, to Her Excellency Hajar Samira Bahumia. Uh, the second lady of the Republic of Ghana, but unfortunately I understand from our colleagues in the CCA that uh, she's unfortunately unable to join and provide her message today. Uh, you will have an opportunity no doubt to hear her again later on because I think uh, CCA is having their annual conference in Ghana uh, later in the year. So unfortunately not at this webinar, but there will be another occasion. Um, with that, I'd like to reintroduce and come back to Jeline Connors Belopolsky, who's the Chief of Staff, as you know, of the Clean Cooking Alliance. Uh, she has such a wealth of experience as well in this area of energy, sustainability, uh, and innovation, as well as connecting the dots for us between clean cooking, trade, and health. Uh, and I think she's no other better person on the panel, really, to talk about these issues. So I'm going to pass the floor back to her to give us an introduction uh, to the work of CCA. So thank you, Jalyn. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here with you. Um, and thank you, Ambassador Manley, for your thoughtful and passionate remarks and for the UK's commitment to SDG 7 and to prioritizing clean cooking as part of your efforts. Very often, we do see a lot of talk and uh, effort around SDG 7, but that disproportionately focuses on access to electricity in many cases, or the scaling of renewables, which are equally important, but clean cooking as part of the mix has, has often fallen down the list of priorities. And so we are 
always happy to hear when governments and, and donors and partners are recognizing the importance of this intersectional issue. So thank you very much for flagging that. Uh, I am very happy to be here and excited for our fantastic panel who you'll hear from shortly. So I won't take too much of your time, but I want to give an overview and go a little bit deeper into some of the um, issues and challenges and statistics that Ambassador Manley mentioned in his opening remarks. Uh, as, as I said earlier, I'm the Chief of Staff and External Affairs at the Clean Cooking Alliance, and we work with a network of partners to build a vibrant ecosystem that will enable the growth of a clean cooking industry that can deliver accessible, affordable solutions to all. Cooking is a fundamental part of life. It's an activity that brings families together and has cultural and social significance around the world. Yet, as we've heard today, billions of people do not have the luxury of safe meal preparation. Instead, they depend on polluting open fires or inefficient climate harming stoves to cook their daily meals. And providing clean energy to households is critical to achieving our global climate and sustainable development herd goals. But today, as we've heard, we are unacceptably off track to reach our 2030 goal of universal access to clean cooking. And that is also jeopardizing our 2050 net zero goals. We've seen some of these statistics um, already, but I like to reiterate them because it is quite shocking to put them in perspective. 2.4 billion people lack access to clean cooking solutions. This costs the world more than $2.4 trillion in damage to the climate and local economies and contributes to more than 3 million premature deaths each year. 120 megatons of climate pollutants are emitted every year from cooking over open fires and inefficient stoves. And more than half of black carbon emissions come from burning solid fuels for cooking and heating homes, making household energy the largest controllable source of black carbon on the planet. It is not possible to overstate the urgency for action, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, where access is particularly low and the absolute number of people relying on polluting cooking fuels and stoves continues to rise. Lack of access to clean cooking is the most underinvested health and environmental problem in the world. Women, of course, bear a disproportionate share of this cost in the form of poor health and safety, as well as lost productivity and well being. Not only does cooking endanger their health from inhaling toxic smoke, but they may be removed from school because of domestic work like firewood collection and walk ever greater distances carrying heavy loads due to forest degradation. In conflict settings, for example, women faced an increased vulnerability to physical attack when leaving their communities or refugee camps in search of fuels. But when it comes to gender, this narrative isn't simply one of victimhood. Accelerating access to clean cooking is a critical tool for empowering women and advancing gender equality. Women are essential to the widespread adoption and use of clean cooking solutions. Their agency as household decision makers and consumers should not be underestimated. And the clean cooking sector presents opportunities for women to make their mark in a growing market. Their involvement as employees and entrepreneurs helps businesses thrive. But let's take a quick step back. What exactly is clean cooking? Part of the challenge the sector faces is that it's not one thing and one solution does not fit all needs. Clean cooking refers to a suite of fuel and stove combinations with emissions performance that meets the World Health Organization's guidelines for indoor air quality. This category includes high efficiency charcoal and biomass pellet stoves, LPG, biogas, ethanol, electric stoves, and pressure cookers. And yes, I said LPG as in liquefied petroleum gas. We get a lot of questions around how a fossil fuel can be considered a clean cooking solution and one that is aligned with global climate goals. And while some may not like the messaging, the science is clear 
LPG burns cleaner than traditional solid fuels without producing significant harmful smoke, fumes, or particulates. And LPG reduces pressure on land and forests. Today, nearly 35% of wood fuel harvested is unsustainable, contributing to forest degradation and climate change. The latest research is showing that a global transition to LPG for cooking would indeed be climate positive compared to the current baseline of unsustainable biomass use. And it's for this reason that we're seeing an increasing number of donors and investors like the UK ODA, FMO, and the US Treasury make exceptions for LPG cooking in their investment strategies. Changing the way families cook each day will slow climate change, will drive gender equality, reduce poverty, and provide enormous health benefits. Yet the level of funding and investment in the clean cooking sector has not matched the global magnitude of the challenge, hovering in the tens of millions of dollars. The latest clean cooking industry snapshot report shows that investment in clean cooking companies has grown at a rate of 20% since 2014. At this rate, which is by no means guaranteed, investment in, the clean, in clean cooking will still fall far below the $4.5 billion in annual investment required for universal access. We urgently need greater amounts of capital to flow into the sector, and we need that capital to come from a much wider pool of investors with varying appetites for risk and return. The sector is indeed gaining momentum and recent investments in business trends we're seeing could represent a turning point. In recent months, several clean cooking enterprises have raised previously unheard levels of capital. The amount of capital raised in the first part of 2022 is more than double what was reported in 2020. And several enterprises have seen significant customer growth, highlighting the potential to deliver pioneering technologies at a transformational scale. The ecosystem continues maturing as more businesses and collaborators from other industries develop partnerships and start new initiatives. The first close and launch of the Spark Plus Africa Fund, the first impact fund financing clean cooking solutions, with a target fund size of $70 million, shows the appetite of a wide range of investors, including development finance institutions, private foundations, and pension funds, for establishing and funding an emerging commercial industry. But with more investment and growth in the sector, we are increasingly seeing companies looking to expand into new countries and markets. This trend obviously increases the dependency on trade across the clean cooking value chain. Some companies are looking at importing cook stoves and fuels into countries where there's little local supply. Others are focusing on local manufacturing and yet still need to import raw materials and machineries. While entering new markets and trying to scale their operations, companies often encounter a variety of trade barriers or unpredictable policies for taxation and duties, which present major challenges in the clean cooking sector. The affordability of cleaner and more modern stoves and fuels is a key access enabler to clean cooking for many vulnerable and poor communities around the world. Higher taxes and duties lead to higher prices of products sold in the formal sector, often driving the lowest income customers towards informally produced and less efficient stoves and fuels. As Ambassador Manley stated in his opening remarks, trade can and should be part of the solution to the issue. The reduction or elimination of tariffs and non-tariff barriers on such goods and the use of appropriate trade policies and international standards has the potential to energize trade in this sector, enhance the dissemination and access of cleaner solutions and technologies, and make them more affordable by reducing their cost to consumers. The Clean Cooking Alliance is committed to building a vibrant ecosystem that can enable the growth of the clean cooking industry to deliver accessible, affordable solutions to all, and is working with the World Trade Organization and other partners to highlight the potential of the sector and advocate for favorable supportive policies. We'll say a bit more on our collaboration and plans for the 2022 Clean Cooking Forum in Accra, Ghana after our panel discussion. 
So it's now my pleasure to turn back to Ho to introduce our wonderful panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jalene. I, I think that was again, you know, a very fantastic and very clear explanation of the linkages between trade, um, clean cooking, health, environment, climate, um, virtually the whole ecosystem of issues that uh, we need to ensure sustainability. And to help us drill down a bit deeper, we, we have a great panel. They represent government. They represent the Clean Cooking Association on the ground in Kenya. They also represent business in terms of a technology company. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, the, the panelists are Michael Akurang Opuku, who is the team leader, policy planning, uh, monitoring and evaluation, Ministry of Trade and Industry, Ghana. Uh, you can see already uh, Michael on the screen. Let me also ask the other panelists to, to put their videos on. We have uh, Mariam Karanja, who's Program Manager, Clean Cooking Association of Kenya. We have uh, Ms. Sophie Odupoy, who's the Group Head of Public Affairs, uh, Coco Networks. Now, I know that some of the panelists do have some time constraints and they need to leave a little bit earlier than, than usual. But I think we'll be able to, to get your insights nevertheless uh, in the time that, that you have. So, you know, we heard some really astonishing figures, I must admit. When I first heard the figure 2.96 billion, I, I thought I had misunderstood. You know, I didn't think it was uh, 2.96 billion without excess, but that's what it is. It's, it's a huge figure. Um, and to get a perspective from the ground, maybe I could start with uh, Ms. Mariam Karanjan, who I understand also has some time constraints. So I think it's good to, to, to begin with you. Um, you know, could you tell us a little bit more from, from what we've heard at a very sort of global level, um, what has been the private sector's experience of trade flows in co clean cooking in the Kenyan market? Uh, and what type of trade barriers um, have clean cooking enterprises encountered? Uh, we heard from Jeline and also from the ambassador that trade and trade barriers is an issue. So if you could give us a little bit more of an explanation on that, that would be fantastic. And maybe down to your own personal experiences or the experiences of the Clean Cooking Association in Kenya, where have you been concentrating your, your efforts or let's say advocacy efforts? So um, if I could ask you to speak for something like five minutes or so, and then we'll move on to the other panelists. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon to all. Uh, thank you for having me this uh, afternoon and morning to them that it's morning in their different places. As introduced, yes, I'm Mariam and I represent the Clean Cooking Association of Kenya. And we are uh, an association that is together members uh, private sectors. Uh, is we represent the voice of the private sector within Kenya and we are based in Kenya, Nairobi. And uh, we have really been doing quite some good work in Kenya. And through that, we have seen some tremendous change within the sector. Um, more so not that we are already there, but we have been able to achieve um, quite a bit and also to be able to push the sector uh, forward. So uh, to the questions that have been asked, um, looking at the private sector and how the experience that has been there on the trade, uh, trade roads that has been there. Uh, this is um, maybe to just explain it in a layman's language, language is to really look at the buying and the selling of the clean cooking products. This looks at both the importing and exporting. I think as a country, we can say that we have come away. We have come a long way uh, looking at us where we are based. We are based in Africa. And as uh, numbers have been read, it's yes, uh, there are so many billions of people, two point something that still don't have access to clean cooking. And when we come close home to Kenya, we still have quite a number. Some studies have been done, uh, reference to the 2019 uh, sector study for Kenya that was conducted that shows that uh, about 64% of Kenyans are still not having clean cooking solutions and more so it's worse in the rural areas where they depend on biomass and open fires and it's at 90 percent where most people within the rural areas have not been able to access the clean cooking 
but looking at the private sector and the growth that has been there, I think we can say we have been able to make tremendous growth as uh, looking at from open fires, having people come invest, be it local, uh, locally within Kenya or even the Kenyan um, context just to be able to transition from the open fires to use of improved, uh, improved stoves which are at different tires from tier one to tier five and seeing these products uh, over time being available, lately available, it has been growth that has taken time within Kenya. And therefore, uh, I have been looking at the, the process that has been happening. Most of these products, some of them, uh, over time, they were being imported. But with time, we have seen some manufacturing companies settling in Kenya and just being able to do the production within Kenya. Uh, others such as LPG, I know Jeline has talked about LPG being a transitional fuel. Uh, looking at our history as a country in the year 2009 is when there was a lot of uh, efforts by the government to see that Kenyans can be able to access uh, use of LPG because the regulations were put in place, there were policies, and then the, it was made easier for us to import the LPG because we are importers, we don't uh, produce it from here. So the growth for uh, the trade flows have been uh, tremendous. They have been uh, moving from one step to another. We have seen a lot of people in having interest to invest in Kenya. Coco Networks have really done some good work also to invest in Kenya and to have their um, their technologies being absorbed within the country. We have also seen others who have really been helping us to do that, although some solutions are still being imported, not all are ma locally manufactured or locally produced, including fuels, but it has been a tremendous growth and we have seen uh, Kenya moving to a good uh, direction. However, there has been challenges to this. It's not been very easy looking at COVID time. I think COVID has hit all of us in 2020. And this has really affected the trade flows in Kenya. That is the way that we have been able to work. And also within the cooking sector, the people who used to import the fuels, the people who used to import the technologies, they were not very easy to transport because we all know there was lockdown and so many issues that came with the lockdown. But also there are other issues such as um, uh, tariffs. Uh, this looks at the import duties that have been imposed. I think Kenya, we started at some point, we were at 10%. Then it moved to 25% import duty. And now starting this July, we got um, some products being moved to 35% import duty, which is really straining the sector in as much as we need to freely move like some solutions such as bioethanol, which have now moved to 35% to import uh, the fuel, it becomes not very easy because the adoption has really not uh, been achieved, as I said uh, about our where we are at within a country. But I think there has been those changes which have really been affecting uh, the sector. But as, as a secretariat, we have really been trying to engage and see how we can really be able to support. Also, there are others which are no non-tariff barriers, and this includes regulations and rules, as in regulations uh, that govern the clean cooking sector. This has also had impacts on the trade because you have to know some, some, some of these products are flammable. Some of them needs to work within uh, standards, within either international standards or local standards to be able to fit the market. But I think over time with the uh, partnership and engagement with different um, government agencies that are responsible, there has been that gradual move. We have not yet achieved like standards for every product, cooking product, but there has been that, uh, that growth. Some products already have the standards, some we have regulations, and this is helping the sector to be able to grow. Also looking at uh, quotas, I think quotas have also been part of uh, 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 an effect that has been affecting trade. Like there are those uh, quantities or qual quantities of products that you're supposed to 
uh, import or export, and this has also had tremendous effects or within the sector. So some some products have quotas, like or how much are you supposed to import at a given time? So those have also had some also some impacts on the same. Also looking at our policies, I think this has also really been a great one. Yes, we have good policies in place, but at the same time we have policies that are very uncertain. Some change very fast, like the intro, uh, the, VA, the import duties and the VAT issues, which have really been changing over time and changing very fast. And this has also affected uh, people not, like investors are very not sure of the enabling environment if I come and start business in Kenya for how sustainable is it because of the policies that are there and therefore our work and what you've been able to do as an association we represent the voice of the private sector and we have been engaging the government first to create awareness to let them know why cooking is important why it should be given priority and why they should take it in also, we have been able to look at the different um, policies that have been there and lobby if there are things that are not right, like the VAT issues, the import duty issues, we can speak up and speak on behalf of the sector and give justification why we need exemption of those uh, VAT and also exemptions of those import duties. So it has been work in progress as a sector and we have really been trying to work with a government and to ensure that as they develop those policies, we too are part of it to see what are they suggesting? Is it good for the sector? Is it benefiting the people who are the private sector and also the end user? Because at the end of the day, it's the end user who uses or produces those uh, products. So that's what we have been able to do. And also we have been lobbying to have incent uh, fiscal incentives and also to have the clear policies that are really speaking uh, to the sector. So there is also a lot on data. I think there has the sector we don't have has been having challenges with data and information, which also as we have really been engaging to see, we have evidence that as we do our advocacy, we are not just going to meet the governments and talk to them without any evidence, but we have really been working to have research, to do research that can really speak that even as we present, we are having evidence-based advocacy. We have the data and we can be able to reach out to uh, the government and tell them these are the numbers, these are the what the data is saying, and uh, this is what is happening within the ground and this is what we required to do. With that, I think the, there has been that growth that we have seen over time. But I can say we have, we have not gotten tremendous or so much, but we have made good strides as a country to be able to see what we are seeing and what people are doing. And also, there has been a lot of partnership. We can't do this alone. We have been engaging our partners. That is the private sector. We can't work without them. We can't work without the government. And also, we can't work without the donor partners who have really been development partners who have really been supportive tech with technical with technical uh, skills with their far finances and all this has really been supporting to see that we can easily do our trade and we can be able to uh, grow as a country i think i'll stop it for now at that Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, Mariam. That was a really very clear explanation. I can really see your drive and de determination on the work that you're doing and also bringing to life to us the, the, the clear trade agenda, I would say, uh, that confronts some of the challenges of clean cooking. Um, le let me turn to Mr. Michael Akurang Opoku, uh, who you know, hopefully can help us a bit on the Ghanaian perspective. Um, you know, uh, Mr. Puku is from the Ministry of Trade uh, of Ghana, and we heard earlier a little bit about, about clean cooking and its work in Ghana. Um, so I don't know if you could help us a bit on, on taking us through why is clean cooking uh, important in the national country context, of course, here in the specifically for Ghana, and, and how do you see the steps that are needed to, to help increase um, availability of clean cooking, of course, especially from a trade perspective, uh, since that is the, the area that you're working in. And if there's any, 
any things you can tell us about um, how international trade can support or what particular policies Ghana may have in, in this respect. So thank you again, Mr. Opuku, uh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you and um, uh, colleague, uh, <coughs> panelists, uh, special recognition to Ambassador Mali for uh, the work uh, he's doing and uh, uh, thank you too for the previous speaker on uh, clean cooking that is happening in uh, Kenya. Um, it's uh, very important to see the discussion uh, in a cultural context, especially with respect to Ghana. Within Ghana, uh, about 75% of the population that live in rural areas rely on uh, buying house to cook. And then about 50% of uh, those living in urban and peri-urban areas also rely on buying house to cook. Essentially, even with respect to uh, cookeries, restaurants. We have small scale restaurants that we talked about who also rely on buying us to cook. So, clean cooking is uh, an issue that pervades our entire cultural system. And so, there's a cultural context that is to be looked at. And then there's a policy context. In terms of culture, uh, cooking is built into our culture. But what we used to cook has also over the years evolved, uh, there's been improvements in the whole uh, clean cooking environment. After Ghana adopted the uh, clean cooking strategy, which is focused at enhancing uh, the enabling environment to improve uh, cooking solutions. And so to your first question, basically what government, government's proposal is to ensure that starting at the rural areas, people are sensitized on the need to move towards clean cooking solutions, not only for environmental purposes, but also for health purposes. Several diseases are related to uh, inhalation of fumes from these uh, biomass uh, cooking solutions. And so the first step is to ensure that a critical mass of the people at the rural areas are sensitized to be able to let them understand the need to move away from clean cooking. Because as I've already stated, it's a cultural, it's in a cultural context. And to be able to move voluntarily from that cultural context, people need to understand the dangers for both the environment and their health and moving away towards clean cooking solutions. Secondly, there's an issue of the national policy perspective. Nationally, governments, is focused on policies for energy transition. And these energy transition policies include clean cooking solutions, uh, which might help support rural and then urban families. So as early as 2013, government was able to give away about 6,000 LPG gas cylinders to families for them to be able to move towards clean cooking. The idea is that uh, people might understand the need to move towards clean cooking, but then because of their income levels, government will need to put in measures to support these people to have access to clean cooking solutions. And that is uh, another one in terms of government's direct support for clean cooking initiatives. Now, apart from the direct support, government also needs to move at the policy level to look at issues that will allow uh, people to move towards clean cooking solutions. The first step in that direction is to ensure that there are favorable policies to allow for access to clean cooking solutions. And this is also in two streams. One, what are we importing in terms of clean cooking solutions? And what are we manufacturing locally as clean cooking solutions? With respect to imports, there's a need to ensure that uh, barriers are removed in terms of uh, standards, testing, uh, access to test facilities and access to even the standards themselves to ensure that when these imports come in, they are easily cleared from the ports. Secondly, with respect to manufacturing, government, government is creating an enabling environment to allow for uh, the assembly of cooking equipment, what we call light manufacturing. So in our 
uh, implementation of our strategic anchor industries. One of the strategic <clears throat> anchor industries we are looking at is light manufacturing, which includes creating the enabling environment, especially using their TRIMS agreement to ensure that there's a favorable investment environment for people to invest in clean cooking solutions, which includes uh, allowing for easy access to technology to be able to assemble cook stoves, to manufacture cook stoves, and to also make sure that it is easily accessible to uh, people. And so basically it's a blend of first support, direct support to the private sector, direct support to households, implementing and or instituting policies that create a favorable environment for imports to come in. And also <clears throat> most importantly, to allow for investment into the sector so that we can drive in a lot of assembly of these cook stoves and other technology to support uh, the clean cooking environment. But as I stated earlier on, there are challenges. For example, the LPG cylinders that were supplied to homes now have issues because then, because of the lower incomes, people also don't have money to buy the LPG into those cylinders. And that is why it is necessary to continue to focus on providing an enabling environment where households can themselves acquire the LPGs into the cylinders that they've been supplied with. So summary, really, this is uh, uh, the perspective in terms of what government is doing and how we can use trade to drive in investment to support the clean cooking environment. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Okuku. I think that again was a really very clear and also very um, on the ground perspective that you gave us. And I think I'm hearing a lot from this conversation about the need of this combination of, uh, of policies, cultural change, as, as you mentioned, uh, as well as the, the real understanding of income and, um, and the communities, the, the type of holistic challenges that they face and that we can't just zoom in just on one solution and we have to look at this in a much more joined up way. Um, and I think to carry that conversation forward a bit more, I'd like to go to Miss Sophie or, or Dupoy from Coco, uh, Coco Networks. And since you, you actually are in, in, in exactly in this area as a technology company, as a, as a private sector uh, company as well, if I could ask you know, your perspective um, in terms of uh, you know, what recommendations you might have uh, or what things you might need as well as a, as, a, as a company to try to just better disseminate clean cooking stoves and the experiences that you've had working in different markets. Um, what has worked well in your engagement in Rwanda? I believe uh, I was asked to, to, to ask you a bit about that. And so a whole bunch of questions um, and the floor is um, uh, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Ho, for the opportunity. And I'll build on what um, His Excellency, the Ambassador, Jilin, uh, Mariam, and Michael um, have said. Um, first, to just a bit of background uh, in terms of who Coco Networks is. Um, so Coco Networks, we are a climate technology company that is active in the clean cooking sector. Um, our ambition is to provide uh, the clean cooking solution. And our clean, clean cooking solution is a two burner cooker that uses bioethanol. Now, to a lot of people, bioethanol has been used. It's, it's, it's not new. It has been used across not only Kenya, but other countries. What is different uh, in terms of how COCO gets the solution is our business model, is essentially how we get the solution into consumers' hands. We recognized that, um, as you rightly highlighted, our um, people who use charcoal and firewood have low income. So they don't have a lot of um, money, uh, essentially, at any point in time to purchase. So they have just enough to purchase maybe for the day or just for the week. Um, so our solution addresses that point and has ensured that we are providing an affordable solution. And we've done that by removing the middleman. So essentially we sell the product directly to the consumer and we, we use what we call Coco Point, uh, Coco ATMs, where we, we have the ethanol and consumers can come and buy fuel uh, from as little as 300 liters uh, all the way to 2.3 liters to refill the canister. So we 
developed our solution um, very well in, in recognition of the challenges that the consumers face. So we came into Kenya in 2015 and through, through the years, we developed various cookers, we developed various cocoa points um, in partnership with over a thousand customers. And it was not until 2019 when we said now we had a solution that we could actually launch with. Um, so we launched with the two banner cooker. We launched uh, October 2019. Uh, we started off in the capital city. And as of now, we are present in over 550,000 uh, households. So we've proven that there's a scalable solution um, that can provide an affordable, safe, clean and convenient uh, solution to uh, to these to these consumers. Now, along the journey, we've definitely faced challenges, um, and I think the first one is uh, also what Mariam alluded to in terms of first the tariff barriers, uh, because we came to Kenya and developed and scaled the solution uh, when we engaged government. Um, the government asked us first prove that your solution can actually work before we start talking about removal of this um, uh, tariff barriers in terms of uh, value added tax and import duty. And we said, okay, um, we, we knew we had a winning solution. So we went into the market and what, uh, what we did as a company is we took, we decided to model to the government of Kenya, what it would look like if the product was sold, we excluding uh, the VAT and the import duty. So we decided let us absorb uh, those, um, those uh, taxes and were able to lower the cooker price and the ethanol price. And essentially that is what has accelerated uptake to the point where we are now, we're now transitioning over 10,000 households a week uh, to our solution. So that, that, that was the first place. Now, in, after we've proven to the government, now we are saying, let please do extend to us um, these exemptions because at, as a business, it's not possible for us to continue absorbing as we continue scaling as rapidly as we are doing. Uh, secondly, what you're telling the government is our solution requires no subsidy. Um, and other solutions have, have, have in their conversations with government, the only way they're able to scale uh, across any country is through subsidy. And this has been proven, especially with LPG. LPG subsidies, I think, have been extended in countries such as India. And the problem with subsidies is that they're not sustainable. What we are telling the government of Kenya and also other governments is that we do not require subsidies. We will bring the investment. All we ask is that the, the taxes that essentially increase the price to the consumer are removed. Um, the, other, the other way we also look at our solution is our solution will our solution will address the challenge across multiple countries we look at it as solving the problem in over 60 countries and in those six 60 countries we're talking about 300 million households now when your ambition is that large you think you, you think forward you think in terms of where will we where can we get where, which country can provide a comparative advantage in terms of manufacturing um, so that we do not have the conversation with every country where they tell us come and manufacture in this country. For us, we approached where would we, where would it make most sense from a cost perspective for us to produce the cooker such that it would be available to each of the 60 countries at an affordable cost. And thus we set up our manufacturing plant in India and that is where we are able to service Kenya. Uh, our challenge right now on the ethanol is the fact that within Kenya, we, 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 are, we are purchasing ethanol um, as a byproduct of molasses or from the sugar industry. Um, the sugar industry in Kenya currently is not, is, is, does not have capacity to meet our demand. Our demand is 3 million liters a month, and we expect to build to 5 million liters by the end of this year. Um, so the push is for government to look for a way of how do you motivate, how do you incentivize uh, investors who are willing to come and set up an ethanol industry. Uh, so that we, we, we do heavy lifting on the upstream side as well. So we do ask governments how, who will provide the, the incentives for someone to come and set up a factory that can produce anywhere between 150 to 300 million uh, liters a year. Um, so we, we have ongoing conversations uh, with uh, various governments as we seek um, for them to understand what, what it would take for us to invest in their country. Now coming to Rwanda, I think Rwanda was the first country 
where we put our ask on the table. We went and essentially said, what we would need from our side is removal of the taxes. Um, and then for carbon credits to remain the property of cocoa networks, because we do use carbon credits to subsidize. And in return, uh, we did promise the investment of $25 million over five years and employment um, of over 500 employees and also the additional income uh, to the agents who, who sell our um, solution. Um, so we are very clear in terms of what it would take to invest in a country. And we are glad that Rwanda came, to, uh, came, came on board. Uh, Michael, we are also coming to Ghana. We will be coming to have that conversation with the government of Ghana. Um, the lesson in Kenya was that it's, unless you have an investment agreement in place where you're able to guarantee stability in terms of the fiscal and regulatory environment, it's very difficult for you to continually invest year after year when you're, there's no certainty in terms of that either five year or, or 10 year period. Um, last but not least is, is what also Mariam alluded to. It is the, the, the battle cannot be won by a private sector player on their own. It is critical for private sector to rally uh, together in behind, um, supported by a business membership association such as uh, CCAK. Uh, so for us, one of the things we did was ensure we had membership in CCAK. We were member, we are members of Kenya Association of Manufacturers, amongst other entities who government, any government tends to listen to a BMO rather than a single. Uh, private sector player. So it's, it's, it's of utmost importance that for anyone thinking about venturing into any market, uh, come in and as much as you have a unique solution, um, engage with government through BMOs. I'll stop at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sophie. I think again, you know, you gave us so much there in, in your remarks in terms of what is the type of enabling environment you require or need to in order to scale up. And I was really impressed with the comment you said that you don't need subsidies and that actually you prefer to, to go directly for investment. And that's really actually a, a conversation that I think we'll be hearing throughout the week here at WTO Aid for Trade about scaling up, uh, about investment, or how can aid uh, incentivize investment. And actually, our Director General in, in, uh, in, in one of the remarks, I think it was yesterday, she actually said we should be thinking about investment for trade and that uh, it, it should be rethought in terms of how we look at this whole dimension of aid for trade. So I think that was really, really, very interesting. Now, I know that some of my panelists are time constrained. I'm not sure, Mariam, are you still with us or do you have to leave or? Or what is your situation right now? I see your name is still here. Um, in any case, um, we, we, we have an opportunity for Q&A with the audience. Um, Jeline said in the beginning that, you know, uh, if you have any questions you'd like to ask this great panel, please send it into the chat. Uh, whilst you're thinking about this, maybe I just kick off with one, one additional question. And Jeline, please, although this is a bit impromptu, feel free to jump in and, and, and share your comments as well or any questions that you may have. Um, I, I think sometimes in trade policy, and I, this is not unique to clean cooking, of course, um, governments are always very concerned about, uh, rightly so, about employment. And they think about trade policies in terms as well, in terms of the employment uh, situation and what it may mean. So I don't know, uh, is there a tension here or, or maybe there isn't? Um, and do you have any examples or data or any evidence that you could tell us about how can this be a win-win? How can actually improving access to clean cooking also uh, improve access to jobs or actually create more jobs? Because um, I think you, when you mentioned households, I imagine that quite a number of them are also in themselves maybe um, producers, not, not just consumers in the sense of uh, consuming services. Um, so any, anyone on the panel actually is a very open question to, to anyone on the panel, including Jeline, which I've now co-opted into my panel as well. Um, if there's any, any answers or comments on that. Anybody like to kick off? Maybe Janine? I'm, yeah. I'm happy to jump in and then I'm sure yeah. Sophie and others will have more, more detailed um, comments there. I mean, 
the exciting thing about the clean cooking sector is the, is the size of the market and the range of solutions that are required across an entire value chain. It is not one product, it is not one fuel. So the potential to grow a market to serve you know, over 3 billion people that require access to clean cooking solutions around the world is enormous. And so as, as Sophie and Mariam were alluding to, the growth potential of this sector and the number of jobs that are required at all aspects of the value chain from the production of the, the fuels and the raw materials, the manufacturing of appliances, the actual distribution and sale of the appliances, the maintenance and the monitoring and the data collection. And there's a role across many, many areas um, within the industry. And so I think there's a little bit of a competition between the sort of um, local manufacturing, what's imported, and there's a tension there, but there is so much opportunity and in particular opportunity for women and youth. I think it is very clear that this is a sector where women play an enormous role, both in the uptake as consumers, but really in their role as entrepreneurs, as, dis as distributors working across the sector, um, as leaders within clean cooking companies uh, and private sector organizations and in government policy as well. We need more women to be coming and advocating for this issue, leading, giving their voice and mainstreaming um, women's empowerment and gender equality throughout their businesses um, and the, the roles that they play within the ecosystem more broadly. And and likewise with youth, if we're talking about opportunities for employment um, in countries where there is a real employment challenge, when you have distribution channels, when you have um, local manufacturing, when you're developing new uh, fuel value chain industries, an entire bioethanol sector, the job potential is enormous. So if we think more broadly beyond just the sort of sale of cook stoves, I think, which has been the sort of historical perception and think about the sector as a whole, this is something that really aligns well with economic growth and employment policies, and we should be supporting that. And I'm, I'm sure Sophie and others will say more, but I'll leave it at that. Great. Th thanks very much, Janine. Uh, anyone like to jump in? Sophie, would you like to come in? Uh, yes, um, I'd like to just add on to what Janine has said. Um, the, in Kenya, the ambition for universal access to clean cooking energy was moved from 2030 to 2028. Um, so the government now has to has no choice but to accelerate um, because we are we are quite far behind uh, in terms of our ambition uh, in terms of the government's that government's ambition. Um, the good thing is government has recognized the need to accelerate, and in recognition of the fact that one solution uh, will not do it, the, the the thinking right now is. How do we bring on board every player, whether it is LPG, whether it is us, bioethanol, um, solar, e cooking, um, bio, uh, biogas? Uh, everybody needs to come to the table. Uh, and we all need to think cohesively instead of where we've been currently thinking in silos. So each of us has been going and pushing forward our agenda. And the government has pushed back and said, let us look at it um, as all of clean cooking. How do we advance, given that there is room? Uh, for everyone. And when we're looking at this room, we're also looking, as, as you said, in terms of upstream. Uh, how can we work with farmers who currently do not have an additional source of income? Maybe they're just subsist subsistence farmers. How can we work with them to produce the feedstock that is required to provide fuel across the various solutions? So it's government has recognized that need. Um, they need now to quantify what is the potential? What what number of jobs are likely um, awaiting them, them giving investors the opportunity to come and invest? For us, we, we did take this a step further. Uh, we worked together with the German government and we developed the bioethanol cooking fuel master plan, which outlines uh, what investment would be required for, for ethanol produced from sugarcane, from, um, from molasses, and also from cassava. So we already have a document that has been owned by the government of Kenya that provides what 
what what number of jobs would be created what is the investment that would be would uh, it would take for someone to put up um, an in, uh, a factory um, and all it needs is for someone to come and take it up and we actually see it see it see it alive so there are a lot of policies there are a lot of documents um, that are that are sitting in a lot of the ministries across government what we need is that just additional push for for them to understand that in less than six years, in five years, we will be hitting the 2028 mark. And where, what do we want to be saying as a country? Do we want to be standing and saying we took the opportunity of the innovations such as bioethanol that were brought to Kenya and we accelerated them and we are much, much closer to the ambition or maybe we'll even have achieved it. Um, the, 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 this challenge we put to government and as much as they put it back to us, we are currently now uh, having roundtable conversations just to see how we can make sure that that ambition is achieved. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie, for the comprehensive answer. And I know I think the points Jeline made about looking at this in a very broad sense and looking at it as a sector um, actually applies to many things in trade policy, that to, to think about that not as in, in a silo, but there's all of the possibilities create, created across the value chain. Um, can I ask Michael, do you have any comment on this particular question that I threw forth before getting the questions from the audience? Uh, I see that I now have two. Um, you can either come in now if you like, or if not, I can just move on to, to the other two. Let's, let's move on to the other two. Okay, all right, great. Um, what I have are two questions, and now maybe I just mentioned both of them uh, to you. It's first one is what is the Clean Cooking Association or others doing to advance use of the gasifier stoves with pallets? So it seems like a, a technology related question. Um, and another question here, um, again, it's a bit technology related. Um, why are solar based cooking solutions not given prominence compared to fossil and agro based cooking solutions? that are inversely creating carbon footprints. So maybe we can combine those two and I turn back to the panel for anyone who'd like to jump in. Um, I think again, the most obvious for me would be Sophie and Janine, but Michael, you also feel free to come in if you have a, a comment on either of those questions. Okay, so um, uh, thank you. Uh, with respect to uh, solar-based solutions, um, the, the, the point is, uh, to use effective trade policies to be able to regulate the imports of inputs. And uh, Ghana has been making strides in that in trying to reduce as much as possible the tariffs on inputs for the assembly of components for uh, solar panels. Uh, the technology is available, but then uh, driving in investment into that sector requires a lot more to be done. And because also the fossil fuels are easily accessible. I mean, we, we should just be realistic and understand that uh, when a fuel is easily accessible, people automatically go in for that one. And so making the technology available in scale, I mean, volumes count. If they are available and there is access, then people can now move towards that. And, and so I agree with Sophie in terms of driving in investment that expands production and creates uh, products out of these technologies is very important. Additionally, we need to start looking at home-based solutions for some of these products. And this also requires investment into developing home-based technologies that improves cooking in these areas, not only solar, but other renewable energy sources that are available to us as Africa. Thirdly, in terms of using trade policy, I think the CCA might have to up its voice in trying to appeal to the AFCFC secretariat so that um, renewable energy or trade in energy becomes part of the negotiation cycle. Uh, if we can focus on driving tariffs on energy products to zero, we can be able to bring in more investment and ensure that certain rules of origin procedures are used to make sure cross-border trade or products that are manufactured for clean cooking in Africa can easily be traded amongst ourselves. 
And so that is one way of trying to use trade policy to ensure that even local manufacture is improved, local technology is developed, and then we can trade amongst each other in terms of these solutions. Uh, our continuous reliance on foreign-based solutions creates a bit of a problem because governments are also focused on revenue. We agree to the revenue side, but we should also look at in what technologies that we can develop, uh, maybe the CCA together with other academic and research institutions in Africa, developing clean cooking solutions that can easily reach rural communities at cheaper cost and are easily accessible. So thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, Sophie or Janine, any comments to these two questions or anything other else you've heard from Michael? Yeah, I, I may just build a, a little bit on what Michael's saying about the importance of national self-determination in de deciding the clean energy transitions and the, the clean cooking transition that best suits their local needs and the mix of uh, solutions that will be required to achieve those national climate, energy, and development goals. And, and this is where the importance of... Um, government coordination and coordination with um, the private sector and civil society is really important to ensure that they're looking at and thinking about and acting on these issues in a really integrated holistic way. So um, as Michael was saying around the development of the solar electricity industry, that needs to be done in a holistic approach to integrated energy planning that also includes access to clean cooking. Of course, renewable powered electric cooking for all uh, is the sort of the dream and we hope we get there someday um, for, for everyone. But in the meantime, we need to be developing the whole suite of solutions that meet the needs of the range of consumers within a given country and within a region. And so we need more of that coordination. We need to be driving those higher tier solutions. But as Sophie was saying before, we need all aspects of the industry to come together and coordinate and look at what does this national transition plan look like? What are the mix of solutions and how do these all fit together? How do we develop the industries in tandem to meet the needs of everyone? If we're developing rural electrification plans and solar energy is coming in in one area, can we integrate clean cooking into that? So we understand the loads and the household energy needs. So we're not solving one piece of the problem and leaving another, which is what's been happening historically. I mean, there are 900 million people without access to electricity. There are 2.4 billion without access to clean cooking. So there are many with some form of access to electricity that still don't have clean cooking. These problems haven't been uh, approached sort of in a holistic way to date. And we need more of that. And I, I think the trade community has a significant role in bringing these together and showing where integration and alignment can support the growth um, and the achievement of national goals. Thanks, Jeline. Um, Sophie, any comment on, on this? Or? No, nothing. I think they've covered okay. it adequately. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. You know, I, you know, I, I, I think this conversation, you know, shows us again that the need for us to be working very much across uh, silos. And I hear I have some couple of interesting comments and also questions that have come in. Um, and I had two new ones that just came in. Is the first one is about carbon credits. Um, it's about how can carbon credits be used to drive access to clean cooking solutions, especially in Africa, by providing an alternative source of financing. Um, what is uh, CCA doing to encourage advocate this? And does Cocoa Network have any experience in the carbon market? So there are actually three questions there. Um, but maybe we'll we'll start with that one and and then come to the next one, which is more about policy recommendations. And we'll probably close with, with the next one. But on this one about carbon credits, um, alternative source of financing, is CCA doing anything in this area? And does Cocoa Network have any experience in the carbon market? Um, uh, I can, it's my short answer is yes, absolutely. We fully encourage the role of um, the carbon market in supporting the growth of the clean cooking sector. We feel it is absolutely 
critical. We do a lot of advocacy work um, on raising awareness around the role of carbon finance, uh, results-based finance, and supporting the sector. We have a new initiative called the Results-Based Finance Initiative that is really looking at creating a space for the sector to provide information, to support um, new methodologies, standards, to reduce some of the transaction costs on companies looking to access uh, carbon finance, as well as um, provide information and support for uh, carbon investors that are looking to get into this market and to show the, the value and the impact of the clean cooking sector. Um, we work with many companies in our venture catalyst portfolio to provide technical assistance to support them in accessing carbon finance. And I, and I know Co um, Sophie can speak uh, to Coco's experience in the market in much more detail, but it is a very important aspect of supporting the growth of the industry. Yeah. Yeah, I'll echo that, Jilin. Um, for us, as I highlighted, the only way we're able to subsidize the cookers and the ethanol is using carbon credits. Um, and what helps is that our founders have a very good understanding of how that the carbon market uh, plays, which I would say is not necessarily the same with a lot of local investors. So they definitely lack awareness of how it works and how they can fit in. Um, our expectation is um, following the, the outcome of COP26 and the fact that governments are now required to put in place um, the structure and the regulations uh, for carbon trading, we expect that more and more investors, local investors, will become aware of this as an alternative um, way to raise revenue and thus be able to contribute and be able to um, set up, as we are saying, local solutions. In some, in some countries, in some areas, uh, local solutions may make more sense. Um, but until those regulations are in place and then government makes sure that they create awareness, we will not necessarily see that the uptick uh, being as fast as it is on uh, other, so other avenues of financing. Thank you. Thanks. I think we're coming towards the end of this panel. And thanks for the, the, the interaction, actually. Sometimes it's the, the challenge for the moderators to get some interaction. And the panelists here, you make it very easy for me. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, the, the last question I had here, I, I guess, is a more question for Mariam, because it, it's, it comes back to asking uh, what were the major policy recommendations that the CCA advocated for uh, to the Kenyan government and, and what did they take up in terms of clean cooking solutions? I, I think Mariam already outlined a few of those. Uh, maybe I can broaden this question out and sort of say, as a final one minute to, to, to my panelists, is that what would you like um, to see as, as, um, as things that the CCA and WTO could work on together uh, and in support of... Um, of governments uh, in this area of disseminating clean cooking uh, solutions. Um, so if there are any thoughts on that, be, be very grateful. Um, and then we'll close this part of the panel. Thank you. Any, anyone like to jump in? If not, we can move straight as well to the closing. And, uh, and then Jeline okay. will have some. Yeah, Michael, please. So um, I think uh, one fundamental thing has been re-echoed in do, during this discussion, and that is investments, how government should drive investments into the clean cooking sector. And it's very important for us to continue re-emphasizing that part. Uh, the investments that uh, can be driven can be looked at in terms of not only taxes, but then creating an enabling environment for investments that looks at long-term benefits when they make these investments. Uh, with respect to our current economic situation in most countries, uh, focusing more on removal of taxes and barriers becomes an issue. What are the other alternatives that are available to us that drives an investment apart from the taxation issue? And that is what, uh, for me, should be a critical consideration for CCA and its other private sector operators. Uh, is it access to financing, uh, re uh, reduce interest rates for industry to invest, uh, reduced regulations, 
and other factors that enable investment to get established in countries. If we start looking at alternatives, because uh, going straight at tariffs has become an issue over time. What are the other alternatives that are available to us uh, that can be used to drive in investment in this particular sector? It looks like it's been a neglected sector over time. How do we make it uh, attractive to business people to invest in the clean cooking sector so that uh, private sector investments are increased instead of focusing more on government because most African governments are constrained and it's a relative we should consider in our discussions. And so how do we make it attractive for investors to come into this sector and make profits out of it. And I agree with Sophie, moving away from subsidies, but then how do we make it cheaper for people and also encourage business people to invest in this sector? If we can push the private sector to take the lead in investing in this sector through very uh, conducive regulations, then it goes to our benefits as an alternative to looking at taxes and other exemptions. And that's, that's what I'll try to drop in as we get to the closing of this panel. Thank you, Michael. I think that's a really important point about investment and investment facilitation um, and, and how to drive that. I think some of the things we heard from the panel so far has been that some of the enabling conditions are things like predictability, uh, certainty, and this type of enabling environment um, it is a general one. I mean, it's what we hear throughout, actually, uh, in WTO about investment facilitation is about these two things, predictability, certainty of, of policy frameworks. But it's certainly something I think is worth drilling further into. And, and there will be occasions to do it. And I, I think I should wrap up because we're coming close to time. Um, but if there's no other final burning comment, I will move on to Jaleen. Um, panelists, do show your hand if you do need to come back to the panel, but it doesn't seem to be the case. On my side is a very brief uh, closing, which is that I think in the time that we've been working with the CCA, we've managed to get deeper into the issue, better understand the trade policy dimensions. As some of the panelists said, the, the need for this to be very much evidence-based, and, and I think, this panel has been really helpful to try to help us to understand, you know, what, what actually is the, the actual situation on the ground, as well as the policy challenges. It's, it's understood that governments have to juggle between many different policy objectives. It's not just one single uh, objective, of course. But at the same time, there does seem to me to be win-win-win opportunities that uh, could emanate from, from this area of clean cooking. Uh, if we deal with it, in a very systemic way, as what I heard repeatedly, I think, through the panel, the need to have a, a sort of holistic uh, sector-wide understanding of um, the, the policy drivers for clean cooking, which would include as well the investment drivers. And I think that's the, the challenge in a way that we, we all uh, are grappling with under the SDG framework. I mean, at the end of the day, the SDG framework, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, is about bringing together this type of integration and so clean cooking is is a, in a way you're a bit ahead of the game you're already doing it in a way you're really trying to bring these elements together and if we can support you in that that would be wonderful um and for that let me just pass on to Janine, who is going to give you a, a bit of a teaser on what's next so thanks Janine. Yes, thank you. And thank you for that fantastic discussion. I always wish we had more time, but I'm very grateful for the time that you've all given today. Um, as Ho mentioned, we have been collaborating with the WTO for the past year to raise awareness of the issue of clean cooking within the trade community. Last October, we kicked things off with a conversation on clean cooking, women in trade, which featured the WTO Deputy Director General Jean-Marie Pogam and another excellent panel of women leaders in the clean cooking sector. And together, we've developed a program of work that aims to improve the transparency and access to data and information on trade policies and regulations in the clean cooking sector. The outcomes of this work will help build the capacity of governments and implementing agencies, support the design of policy interventions, and contribute to an enabling environment that can incentivize private sector investment in the clean cooking, as we've been discussing. 
We aim to share insights from this work and to keep the conversation going at the 2022 Clean Cooking Forum to be held in Accra, Ghana this October 11th, 12th, and 13th. The Clean Cooking Forum, for those of you who don't know, is the flagship event for the clean cooking ecosystem. It brings together a diverse set of actors to both take stock of progress and identify solutions to accelerate action. It will be a very exciting, forward-looking event. We hope that the forum is a platform to address challenges, catalyze impactful conversation, mobilize investment, and drive action towards achieving universal access to clean cooking. So we very much hope that you will join us in person or virtually. You can register on our website, cleancooking.org. And we hope to see you there. But as we are out of time, I want to say thank you again to our speakers and for everyone who joined today, to the WTO team, Aid for Trade organizers, and our wonderful sponsors, the UK and the government of the Netherlands. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye.